this is not my work. This is Melanie Duval from the universe, um, University of Toulon, I think, in, in France. Um, so I'm just going to read and then we can discuss it. Um, I considered starting a few bad French jokes, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there might be some dodgy spelling mistakes in here. Um, uh, yeah, I think the way to handle this is to just, if anybody wants to pop in, pop in with questions. I know Melanie's interviewed me, uh, some of you here, and has got a critical of both Kaiser and Wildlife and Amarfa, so it's a tricky one for me to, to go and read through. Um, conservation is in essence a political process. I think James has made clear, uh, going back to, to, to actually both of the previous talks, is there's a lot of political influence. This isn't just cultural conservation, natural conservation too. Um, conservation, and especially in both uh, disciplines, aims to transit, transmit some objects and sites that a society recognizes as valuable and would like to transmit to the next generation due to values given to these sites. So it's a combination of these values that contribute to the identification of these sites and objects as heritage. If we consider this approach that Melanie suggests, the preservation and the way of how to protect in order to transmit requires an analysis of the factors that might impact on the heritage values. So um, her stance is that one should actually look at what impacts and why is it heritage before we look at the actual conservation and the processes. Because uh, the, these factors are directly linked with the values given to the object and the situation of utterance production of these values. As Mace, Mason said, values are fundamentally contingent. In other words, that they are socially as well as spatially constructed. And I think that's why segmentation, just from my point of view, is probably a good thing to look at, at, at the heritage tourism things, because you are looking at different values that different people have towards different resources. Um, the aim of the presentation is to discuss the heritage values given to rock art, the factors that might impact or harm them, and the way this complexity may be addressed by stakeholders in charge of this management. However, this approach targeted on the heritage values asks the question of methodology, which may be relevate, uh, relevant to addressing this. The, um, the presentation is based on the rock art sites of the Ukeshlamba, now Melotic Rock and Spurk Mountains. Uh, 600 sites have been identified, and um, here yeah, she incorrectly says that it's part of the World Heritage Site, because they're all, all the sites within the, the boundary is. Um, and now the incorporation of Setzlabatebe National Park. At the same time as being protected, some of the rock art sites are open for tourism. I think in the buffer zone and in the um, actual protected area, we've got about 42 now. Sonia, about 42. Uh, the buffer zone to the Amanguan, Amazizi area too. Um, after a period of low activity from the beginning of the 20th century, visits to rock art sites have increased since the beginning of the 21st century. Um, rock art tourism contributes to a general wish to develop cultural tourism with the aim of diversifying the tourist image of South Africa and to correct imbalances of the past and to promote the emancipation of previously disadvantaged segments of our population. That again links to what James has said. If we're doing conservation for benefit, then we, we're starting to realize we're, it's, it's a bit of shaky ground. Um, other social issues have to be mentioned, such as rock guard are also part of the everyday life of local communities living around them, some of them used for medicinal purposes, for religious purposes, in or sheep or goat shelter. In my next talk, I'm going to talk about the differences between us and, um, and Kakadu National Park and touch a bit on the, the social and community use of sites. Um, consequently, the rock art sites of the Drakensberg are of hybrid heritage, crossing institutional and living dimensions. 
It is necessary to develop a holistic approach in order to take into account the diversity of the practices and the values given to them. Presentation will follow three points. Uh, address the way in which rock art preservation is currently approached and the values behind that approach. Develop the methodology used in this research to evaluate the values given to rock art sites and focus on the factors that might contribute to the evolution deterioration of these values in a different context. And then some reflections on management. Closely linked to Western concept of what heritage means, rock art preservation first aims to protect the physical conditions of the rock art. And I think that's what our legislation, James has alluded to it, it's about physical site preservation. In this context, the main issue is to understand the alteration processes of pigments and rock art surfaces. Following such a naturalist approach, alteration processes are classified according to their origins, anthropogenic or natural. Each of them is a, a separate between physical, chemical or biological factors. Scientists and managers try to implement actions to avoid the occurrence of the deteriorating factors. Closing sites, drip lines, uh, public awareness, local immunities, etc. Currently beyond the diversity of alteration processes, the majority of research done on the subject underlines <coughs> the importance of anthropogenic factors. This way to conceive rock art preservation focuses mainly on aesthetic values. The aim is clearly to protect what we see. In a post-colonial context, this way to conceive heritage management has been accused to be a mark of cultural imperialism. In so a reaction of this classical way to protect cultural heritage, values-based approaches has been developed. The aim of this methodology is to evaluate the types of values given to cultural heritage in order to find a consensus and to elaborate on a shared and multi-appropriate management plan. In this strange environment, the articulation and understanding of values have occurred, acquired greater importance when heritage decisions are being made about what we conserve, how we conserve it, where we set priorities, and how to handle conflict interests. A literature analysis on value-based approach indicates that there are two ways to proceed. Firstly, a pre-established typology of values, and the second one um, from a pre-established typology of stakeholders. Our point of view, the two approaches are unsatisfactory as both of them do not take into account the processes of hybridization that may be observed in the field. Process of hybridization seem to be many between the values and the stakeholders. In order to go beyond the dictumous approach, we have tried to uh, develop a holistic and multidisciplinary approach. As Masson um, advised, no single discipline or methodology yield full or sufficient assessment of heritage values. Therefore, a combination of methods from a variety of disciplines should be included in any comprehensive assessment. The methodology and values. Um, I think what she has done is uh, categorize them, uh, whether they're in or outside the World Heritage Site, accessible conditions for both local, commun local communities and tourists, level of equipment for tourism purposes, number of tourist accommodation in the vicinity, number of tourists per year, state of preservation of the paintings, and social users. Sixteen sites have then been visited. In order to go over pre-established typologies of values or stakeholders, an empirical method has been developed. Um, I'm not going to go into this. I know uh, from her work she's used a lot of statistical programs, etc. Um, the approach crosses material and human sciences, and um, I'm not going to go into much details. Putting in perspective these case studies underline a double, double level of hybridization. With, on the one hand, value registers are linked with one uh, to each other, and on the other hand, values which are not specific to certain groups of stakeholders, but are mobilized by each one in a different way. Now, these are the values. Scientific, historical, and educational values. Um, I'm not going to give you the examples. Dom domestic values, uh, that's got to do with the sheep, etc. Campsites for tourists. Economic value. Aesthetic value, recreational values, spiritual values, and cultural identity values. I'm going to talk a bit later on this one, and I must interject here that um, the actual 
authors of the rock art and the Drakensberg are spatially and temporally removed from the paintings. That we have different communities than the original authors and that only statistically a small number of that community actually gives spiritual value to these sites. There's more domestic value and economic value nowadays of the promises has been made about economic values given. Um, so um, just quickly scanning through it is that what Melanie is basically saying is that preservation policies needs to look at these different values and at the impact that they have on site management and the context in which rock art sites are inscribed and how these contexts are interlinked and participate to the enunciation and the evolution of values given to rock art site. Now the context in in, on the evolution and deterioration, by the way I think that linking the term evolution to deterioration of values is quite interesting. Considering the time um, this, uh, she, I have, um, will simplify the relation between each of the values. Environmental context. In the Drakensberg area, the environmental context is characterized by processes impacting on the state of conservation of the paintings, what uh, can involve in return an evolution of the values given to the rock art sites. So basically, she's looking at humanity, um, geological processes, etc. Without falling into a deterministic logic, the environmental context of the rock art sites in the Drakensberg influences the value. In an oversimplified way, the state of physical characteristics of rock art may in impact, therefore, on the aesthetic value, economic value, and scientific. I think it's quite clear cut. If it deteriorates, it loses some of these values. However, the environmental context seems to have low impact on domestic, spiritual, and cultural values. I think it's quite clear that um, if there's some um, kind of water damage or something, it's not going to really affect whether, uh, affect whether it's, uh, they can house sheep in, in there. Um, and she brings in some, some local history that uh, damage to a paint won't necessarily influence the spiritual. Um, it will be irritated um, by more human actions, the spiritual importance in actually something like water flowing over it. And I have to be honest, as a Burki, I have no idea what protean social context is. Social context, I do. So if anybody wants to interject here and tell me what protein means, I will be... Uh, it sounds like something that you use for one of the what bunting diets that you <laughs> folks are on. Um, now, rock art sites in the Drakensberg are embedded in a complex social uh, context characterized by several types of users and, 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 and practices which contributes to the construction evolution of the values. Local communities, as well as tourist hikers, rock art sites are shelters or to keep animals. These practice may harm the scientific and recreational tourism value as animals or human fires may impact on the paintings, but as a living heritage site, it seems to be acceptable. The same ambivalent situation is observed by graffiti. Our ancestors, they express themselves by painting. We buy graffiti local people tell us. My little interjection, bear in hindsight that these communities are not the descendants of the actual painters, so there's been an ownership now of painting, of, of, of sites and values, and that's why it becomes more complex, uh, because we technically will deal and have deal, dealt, most of us, there with some descendants from elsewhere in Africa and Southern Africa wanting to comment local communities and then from a preservation point of view. So we have um, the spiritual practices um, that might impact on uh, the physical conservation of the site, um, but obviously the spiritual values become high. Recreational and tourist context, the links between tourist dynamics and the values are complex, and it depends on the way that um, social activity, tourist activities are developed. Without control, tourists may impact on the values of the site. Um, and then uh, examples are used. And this is why some of the communities do not want tourism at these sites, because they said it impacts on the spiritual 
value of it. But one of the things that, that Melanie is, is quite strong on that is if we take a, m a more integrated holistic approach that um, tourism might actually enhance <coughs> the preservation of rock art sites. And this is where she becomes critical of uh, Amalfa and Kaiser in Wildlife. Um, uh, Kaiser in Wildlife being charged on the environmental sector and Amalfa Provincial Agency in charge of cultural heritage management, her words. Um, it, she notes here that UNESCO noted a mismatch between the management requirements and the expertise of Kaiser in Wildlife, which seems to be entirely focused on plants and animal conservation. Sorry, Sonia, no birds particularly mentioned here. Um, and the memorandum of understanding that, that then uh, happened between um, Omafa and Kaiser in Wildlife. And then she is critical that this temporal, situ temporal situation has now seemingly become um, much more tourism. And one of Melanie's big gripes against this current situation is the fact that between a and Kaiser in wildlife, nobody's actually taken ownership of the proper tourism development and advertising. Um, because it's, as James says, don't smudge the lines and stick to core functions. It's not, uh, her, her particular problem is that there's no entity or a section within the two entities that actually is a champion for the tourism promotion and development of the sites. Um, her point is that no one is legal, within these two entities, no one is legally responsible for tourism development of cultural resources and that none of the organizations take an active responsibility for this role. These relations between the two main stakeholders involved in the Drakensberg management potentially impact on the identified values. The main consequence of a lack of a clearly identified leadership for rock art tourism promotion is, is a shortcoming in tales of custodi uh, custodian uh, tourist guide training with local people interested in becoming tourist guides, followed only by a one-day training workshop. I do have to say here that she seems to have a slight misunderstanding here that the custodians are not guides. Um, so she can't say that we only offer a one day guiding. Um, uh, they are taught what to do on rock art site in order to prevent damage, but they le learn very little about the meaning of the paintings. The lack of knowledge impacts on the values given to the rock art sites, particularly educational, recreational, economic and cultural because of the quality of the tourist Institutional context and regulatory f um, framework. I think um, she's here again criticizing the fact that uh, it, it is in her words a post-colonial framework and I think uh, we have touched on that already that there is issues with regards to the splitting of, of legislation and responsibilities. Um, in other words, what the conservation has to be in South Africa, more generally in all post-colonial contexts, uh, rock art conservation is linked with the discipline of heritage conservation, formalized as a we uh, Western world, uh, European world and characterized by this continuity between the monuments considered as relics from the past and current social processes. So. Um, Basically, she feels that the rock art management in the Drakensberg focuses mainly on aesthetic aspects, and a spatially socialist concept of consolation therefore leads to between a split between rock art sites and the actual local groups. Consequently, rock art sites located inside the World Heritage Site and closed by tourists, uh, enclosed by tourist equipment. As is the case of game bar shelter, local people have to ask permission to access the sites and have their rituals to do that. Thank you. Finally, even though the cultural agent in charge of the rock art sites has was created, finally, even though the cultural agency in charge of rock art sites in this area was created after the end of apartheid in order to develop a holistic conception of heritage, this agency still has a Western heritage management. It is directly linked with the ideological and political context in which rock art tourism has happened. Um, I 
think at this stage um, we can end and, and discuss it a bit. Like I said, I'm giving a presentation that criticizes both KZN Wildlife and my own organization.